Let's now turn in our Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. And I'd like for us to begin the reading this morning at verse 11 of Nehemiah chapter 2. This is God's holy word. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate, to the dragon spring, and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down, and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate, and to the king's pool. But there was no room for the animal that that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley, And inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. And thus far the reading of God's holy word. Well, this morning we are returning to our study of Nehemiah. We're in chapter 2. And you remember that Nehemiah, along with the book of Ezra, is a book about reformation. Ezra is all about rebuilding the temple. And Nehemiah is about rebuilding the walls and city of Jerusalem. And so this is a work of rebuilding, a work of restoring, restoring the temple and restoring the city and its walls, restoring it to what it used to be, to what it ought to be. And this is why these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, are to be understood as books about reformation, about reformation, the reformation of the church the reformation of a Christian family or a local congregation or the reformation of an individual Christian in his walk in the world. Rebuilding what has been broken down by sin. Rebuilding and restoring what has remained in ruins because of apathy or habit or a loss of faith. Now, we've already seen over the past several weeks how the book began with Nehemiah's sorrow, his great weeping over the condition of Jerusalem. We saw how Nehemiah began to pray and fast that God would use him to rebuild the city. And then we saw how God's favor uh, visited Nehemiah, how the Lord allowed the king to give Nehemiah provision and sent him on his way to Jerusalem. And last week, we saw that as Nehemiah entered the promised land, before he even got to Jerusalem to seek the welfare of the church, that Satan had already been alerted of his intention. And so we see the principalities, the spiritual principalities at work, how Satan stirred up the the hearts of Sanballat and Tobiah to be upset already that this was what was intended. Now today we are going to continue looking at this great rebuilding of the walls and we are now looking at the first steps 
the first concrete steps that Nehemiah took to rebuild the wall. And the first thing I want you to notice is that Nehemiah begins with a three-day pause. A three-day pause. Look down at your Bibles at verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night. Now, what is happening here? Why did Nehemiah wait for three days before he began his investigation of the walls? And then why would he go out secretly? Well, it may be that when Nehemiah came to the city, his first impression simply overwhelmed him. Up until now, he had heard about the broken down walls. He had heard about the condition of the city. And now he comes and he sees it for the first time with his own eyes. And it may be that he was overwhelmed and shocked by it. He certainly would have had the wide view, right? That's the first view he had as he would approach the city. He could take the whole thing in. And that's a very overwhelming sight. Sometimes our first impression, our first um, real glimpse of the whole situation, maybe of a, of a local church and what's going on, maybe as we take in the view of the whole church in Canada, maybe when we take in the view of a Christian family, if it's broken down or a Christian's life, the first view that we have might be overwhelming and we think it's hopeless. Sometimes our first views make us think, think that, you know, there's no hope. There's no hope at all. I mean, we had a little snowblower, you know, that wouldn't start, just wouldn't start. And the first thing that I do is just is say, you know, it's a, it's a number of years old. It's just not going, it's hopeless, that's it. You know, let's throw it out and get a new one. Until it's it was taken in to the repair shop where they did a thorough examination and replaced the spark plug and it works fine. But our first impression might overwhelm us. And we might then be shocked and not know where to begin. And perhaps this is what happened to Nehemiah, just taken aback by what the condition really was. Others suggest that Nehemiah took three days in order to rest from his long journey before he began to evaluate the city. He needed time to adjust himself and prepare to do this work. After all, he had been traveling for many weeks. This was a long journey that he had taken, and he wasn't just going to jump into it. And so he may have taken this time to regain his strength. And you know, there is practical wisdom in that. When we're tired, when we're weary, we can be very emotional, and it's very difficult to make a rational, calm assessment of what needs to take place in terms of reforming our lives, setting ourselves back on track, as it were, to walk with the Spirit. Well, whatever reason was the actual reason for this three-day pause, we, we know that Nehemiah had reason for this three-day pause, and it's clear that he began to act after this pause. And so he was prepared then to go out to investigate. And that brings us then to the next thing that we're going to look at, and that is Nehemiah's careful examination of the walls. Notice again in verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. Then I arose at night. Now Nehemiah is prepared to begin the work. And this is how the work of rebuilding began. With Nehemiah arising in the night to go and make a careful examination of the walls. 
These are the first concrete steps to real reformation. We have to make an honest and careful examination. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Or Lamentations 3.40. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Galatians chapter 6. Let each one test his own work. 1 Corinthians 11.28. Let a person examine himself and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. And Psalm 139.23. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Nehemiah arose at night to do a careful examination of the walls. Nehemiah had a purpose. He had a purpose. It says, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. See, that was his purpose. That was his purpose. Nehemiah is there to restore the city, and he begins at night with this examination. Why did he do this? Well, you notice he he didn't go out there to cry over the city walls. Nehemiah did not weep. There are no tears here. He's not looking over the rubble in order to make himself sad again. Nehemiah had already wept over the condition of the city for months Nehemiah shed tears. For months he prayed and fasted. But now is the time for action. It's time to stop weeping and start working. Now, you know, when it comes to reforming the church or a local congregation or a Christian home or an individual's Christian's life, There are some who never want to go beyond weeping over the ruins. All they want to do is to cry and shed tears over how bad things are, how hopeless it is. I'm sure there are many pastors and elders who have experienced, as I have, Christians who do nothing but cry and complain about the broken down condition of their family, of their life, of their church, but they never want to put away the tears. They just want to keep talking about how bad it is and never really seriously look at, well, what needs to be done? What do we have to do? No, they would rather say, have, just cry with me, just weep with me over this. Well, you know, there is a time to put away the tears and to begin the work of examination a time to stop crying about how ruined your life is, how backslidden you are, there's a time to arise. To arise and to start to do something. And Nehemiah shows us where it is that we should start. Where we should start. We should begin with a sober, sincere examination of what the problems really are. What really needs to be rebuilt? You notice he goes out at night without telling anyone. No doubt, there were many good things taking place in Jerusalem. Right? The temple had been rebuilt. Worship was taking place. There no doubt were many zealous Jews in Jerusalem, zealous for God. In the daytime... When everyone's awake and the city is bustling with activity, it would be easy to focus attention on everything that's good that's taking place. And indeed, when it comes to any Christian, any Christian congregation, any Christian family or home, there's, there are always things that are good. There are always things that are seen in the light of day, outwardly. Like the seven churches in Revelation, there's something commendable in all of them. But Nehemiah goes out in the quiet of the night, when there are no distractions. He goes out in the darkness to look at those things that are dark. He goes out alone 
because he needs to make an honest assessment for himself. He doesn't want someone there who will discourage him, who will point things out that are unrealistic or not important. And you know, it's important that we realize that Nehemiah is not making this examination in order to decide if the walls can be rebuilt or not. He's not going out there to say, well, is it possible or is this a write-off? No, he's going in order to see what needs to be done. He knows the walls can be rebuilt. He knows that Jerusalem is never a write-off. And no Christian is ever a write-off. And no Christian home or Christian congregation is ever a write-off. Now, some of you have been in car accidents, and the insurance assessor comes out and looks at your car and decides, shall we repair it or write it off? And, you know, it seems that it doesn't take much to write off a car now. As it did in the old days, you know, the thing could be almost completely destroyed, and they'd still say, we're going to rebuild it. But today, some of the lightest fender betters and the whole car is written off. God's work is never written off. No Christian is ever written off. God can restore and rebuild any home, church, individual. The Lord can restore. But it must begin with a careful examination, an honest examination, a sober examination. Look at verse 13. When I went out by night by the valley, I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that were destroyed by fire. Then I went out to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the walls. And I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. Here's a careful, thorough examination. Nehemiah goes around the whole city, and he looks at every part of the city. Well, what about you? Have you ever examined and inspected the walls of your faith, the walls of your heart, your congregation, your family? Is it time for you to do so? Perhaps even in the hours, the quiet hours of the night on your bed, to make a serious examination of your heart, of your Christian walk, of what's going on in your family. The walls. What is the condition of God's house within you? You know, a description of what we might say the walls of the Lord's house within us should look like, uh, really can be found in our membership vows, right? Have you ever considered our membership vows? As you examine your heart, do you diligently read the Bible and engage in private prayer? Or is that a wall that's broken down in your life? What about keeping the Lord's day, attending worship, giving, and contributing in your tithes and offerings. Are these strong walls in your Christian walk or are they burn down gates? What is broken down? What really needs to be fixed? You notice that Nehemiah went around the whole city making a list all of what needed to be rebuilt and fixed. He didn't just say, oh, what we need is, uh, is this. And you know, there are those who think that way. They look at a Christian congregation and say, all we need is an outreach program. All we need is a youth program. All we need is this. Simple, simple plans, simple things. This is all we need. No, there needs to be a careful examination. What is the problem here? Is it a doctrinal problem? Is it a family worship problem? Is it a contribution problem? What is it? You know, it's been pointed out that the word for inspection here, that as Nehemiah was looking at the walls, the word for inspection here is probing the wound. Probing the wound. You know, like having a bandage over a festering wound and there's that fear 
what is it going to be really, what is it going to look like if I pull that bandage off and I have to look at the wound? And there can be a resistance to look at the wound. Let's just keep it covered up and ignore it. And maybe it'll go away. Some won't want to look. Let's just keep the bandage on and continue as if nothing's wrong. Let's just keep living in the broken down city with the ruined walls and the burned gates rather than seeking to rebuild it so that it will stand as a glorious citadel for God. What is the condition of your heart? What is the spiritual estate of your home? Have you grown content to live in a ruined city? Or are you ready to make a serious and careful examination of your life, of your family, of how you've been conducting yourself in order to identify what needs to be fixed? Not to throw up your hands to say it's hopeless, but in order to know what needs to be addressed. Again, such inspections are not for discouragement because God is willing and able to help you to fix and restore. But you must be serious about your inspection. Search your heart. Identify where are the problems. Look at what Nehemiah sees in verses 13 to 15. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went out to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under my feet to pass. Walls broken down. Gates burned with fire. Places that were so ruined, Nehemiah couldn't even traverse over them. These are all the effects of sin and neglect. And there's a variety of effects, aren't there? Different kinds of damage. Different degrees of damage. Perhaps you see the effect of the use of your tongue and the damage that it's caused in your life, in your family, at your work. Perhaps you've seen the neglect of prayer and the damage that it has caused, the neglect of family worship, of godly counsel to your children. Maybe you see an addiction, a habitual sin, alcohol, drug, pornography, and it's done so much damage in your, in your house that it's as if there's just rubble there. You can't even traverse over it, like Nehemiah not being able to walk or proceed over it. But remember, Nehemiah is not making this examination in order to conclude nothing can be done. It's too late. He's doing it to understand what needs to be done. And this is what you and I must do. Identify what is really wrong, what needs to be rebuilt. Nehemiah went around the whole city taking this inventory. And so must you and so must me. This is where Reformation begins. And you notice in verse 16 that Nehemiah didn't tell anyone. Reformation must begin with you. With your own serious examination and assessment. Had Nehemiah started by telling everyone, I'm going to go and look at the walls and see what needs to be done, there would have been people who would have distracted him, dissuaded him, giving their different opinions and different voices. People there had become used to the city's condition. Nehemiah, it's no use. We've looked over it. It can't be done. They'd be ready to point out why it's impossible. Others might have unrealistic ideas about how to go about rebuilding. But Nehemiah had to be settled in his own mind. So he makes this realistic, sober assessment. Well, then finally, notice how Nehemiah encourages others to begin the work with him. Nehemiah encourages others to begin the work with him. Verse 17 then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. 
And I told them of the hand of my God that he that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Nehemiah encourages the others now to begin this work with him. And notice that he begins by first explaining to them or reminding them that the city ought to be glorious. The city ought to be glorious for God. You know, we sang just a little while ago from uh, Psalm 48. And there we sang, Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Nehemiah is reminding them, look, you're a Christian. This is God's city. This is God's church. It ought to be glorious. It shouldn't have its walls broken down. We shouldn't be this way. A Christian church, a Christian home, an individual Christian ought to exhibit the glory of God at work. We're backslidden and we need to rebuild. Nehemiah reminds them and he encourages them. We ought not to be content with this situation. And then he goes on to remind them or to point out to them how God has already shown his indication, his intention to build and rebuild the citadel. Nehemiah reminds them of how God's favor had already been upon him. And that's something that we need to remember as well. If God has begun a good work, he is faithful to complete it. When God begins the work of redemption, he will complete it. And therefore, we can strengthen our hands in God's promise to be faithful and to help. And finally, to remember that we together, as God's people, are to be an encouragement to one another in it. Nehemiah doesn't point his finger and says, now you must rebuild. No, he says, let us rebuild. We can rebuild. And this is how Christians are strengthened in the work of reformation. Well, let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that the work that you have begun, you will complete. And we pray, O Lord, even in our own day, as we have considered past generations, perhaps hundreds of years ago, when the Christian church and the gospel had so much influence within the nations, and how today there is so little influence, how broken down and uh, ruined, as it were, the visible churches in our land. Lord, we also consider even in our own lives how there are many walls that are broken down in our own homes, things that need to be rebuilt. And we pray, O God, that as we would make an assessment of what needs to be done, that we would take courage and be encouraged in your promise that your desire is to have us built up, to have us walk in the Spirit. And we pray, O Lord, that you would bless us in this great work of rebuilding and reformation. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.